Capsi Podcast Series, Conversations on African Philanthropy. Welcome to another episode of our Conversations on African Philanthropy with me, Peking Kosmoyo. I am your host. I direct the Center on African Philanthropy and Social Investment at the First Business School in Johannesburg. I'm joined by a long-time friend, colleague, a sister, Sarah Mukasa. Welcome. Thank you, Becky. It's nice to be here. And thank you for agreeing to do this at the sidelines of um, the event that was hosted by Agent Action Africa and Trust Africa mm -hmm. on reimagining feminist Pan-African uh, movements mm -hmm. or philanthropies for that matter. Mm -hmm. But you and I come a long way. And uh, just before we started recording, I was saying that I have some nostalgia because mm. at the time when we were setting up the African Grandmakers Network, we were all thirsty for knowledge and uh, we saw each other traveling from Pelagio all the way to Accra. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing you mm. on a paper on <laughs> setting or establishing the AGN. Right. And I wanted us to start there. Um, we moved backwards in order to then be here. Right. What have been some of the things that you know you could look back and say we've made extensive successes in mm. the field of philanthropy? Right. Well, thank you, Becky. We're going back a few years now in this recollection. But I, you know, you remember when uh, the founding director of uh, the African Women's Development Fund B.C. Adele Fayemi, and the founding director of Trust Africa, Akwasi Edu, um, had had a number of conversations uh, between them about their discomfort on the discussions of uh, philanthropy, which positioned Africa very much as having no other contribution to philanthropy except as recipient. Um, they had been through their struggles to set up uh, the, the, the first uh, African funds, philanthropies on the continent, had, had gone through their various struggles to do this, had gone through a number of questions where they were being asked about, you know, what's your capacity to manage this fund? Is Africa ready for an autonomous fund? And all of these things. And um, you recall that uh, they uh, and, and all of us were in discussions about how best uh, do we do this. Um, and we came together, uh, a number of um, foundations, um, or, or, you know, Southern Africa Trust, uh, Foundation for S Civil Society, Civil Society yeah. Urgent Action Fund Africa, uh, Kenya Community Development Fund, and a number of others, community funds and so on. We thought, let's come together. And one of the first things we wanted to do was to tackle that narrative, to challenge that narrative about Africa's lack of giving, or Africa, or, or the 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 giving in Africa, or the philanthropy that was carried in Africa, which was completely inv invisibilized and delegitimized by the assumptions that it didn't exist. And um, you recall that at that time, what you were doing were, was two things, I think two key things. One was, uh, again, looking at and trying to unearth the rich tapestry, the rich mosaic of giving on the continent. But two, the second thing that you were trying to do was, I think, to justify the establishment of autonomous funds um, on the continent. Yeah. Why autonomous funds um, on the continent? We wanted those funds to be able to fund the things that we wanted to do in the way that we saw um, needed to be done. So the key questions I think that you, we were trying to 
relate to was one, African philanthropy exists, two, it's time for autonomous uh, funds, institutional life practice of, of philanthropy, um, and I guess three, really understanding what it meant within the, Af the African context to address the issues of social justice um, philanthropy. Because yeah. at the time we, we uncovered that there was a lot of giving, there was a lot of giving on the continent, um, but there was very little in terms of social justice. So how are we going to frame social justice philanthropy um, um, on the continent? And I think those are the two sort of three key questions that we were trying to grapple with at the time. Yeah. So I see now that um, you are the division head for Women's Rights Africa at the newly created um, Open Society Foundations Africa, mm -hmm. for that matter, where various foundations from across the continent came together. Mm. Can we talk a bit about that transition mm. from several foundations mm. to one foundation? Mm. And we'll come back to talking about some of the issues uh, or implications for philanthropy. But for now, I just want to understand Mm. what you went through, some mm. of, what were some of the successes, what were we trying to address mm -hmm. as several foundations and where we are today? Mm. I mean, I think the, the, the motivation for transition within the wider OSF um, constellation or foundations, as it were, was one, a need for a better focus, better impact better focus yeah. uh, and better impact, and also responding uh, to the you know, challenges that we identified at the time in more uh, flexible, nimble, and impactful ways. And I think there were also questions about efficiencies, uh, about administering funds and so on. Yeah. So there's a whole process of research, looking at peer organizations and how they run their institutions and so on and so forth. So I think that was that at that level, the wider OSF. Within that conversation, I think we in Africa realized that this might be a moment where we might be able to come together as one continent, having recognized the many of the challenges that we were dealing with in the various countries, you know, had a, 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 a root cause that was similar to all of us, that, that was applicable to all the countries in Africa. And we thought this might be an opportunity for us to come together to pool our resources, to pool the resources, financial, technical, uh, you know, knowledge, and so on, um, and also, uh, I suppose, make granting making in in more strategic ways, um, but also that really reflected, I think, um, the aspirations of the constituencies yeah. that we were working mm. with um, on the ground at the time. So, in that sense, it was a moment for us to come together. Something we hadn't done in any sort of institutionalized way. Individuals within organizations used to uh, come together. Yeah. The other thing I think that was um, uh, important at that time was I think the relationship between the global programming and the autonomy that um, the regional programs, Africa being one of the regions, the African continent being one of the regions, the autonomy that they had in shaping um, an agenda and a set of priorities. Um, you know, I think we turned, the <laughs> we turned that bucket, you know, in a way that would allow that um, identification of priorities from sort of the regions um, up and yeah. shaping partnerships with global programs. And I think that was another useful um, conversation that needed to be had. I think, you know, of course the challenges are, it's, you, you, it's n legally, 
the structures, the systems, the jurisdictions, the legal yeah, jurisdictions, yeah, yeah. and all of those, all those are not easy to, as, as one of our colleagues said, Brian Kagoro said, we are, we are giving birth to the new as we bury the old. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it hasn't been that easy to bury the old right. in terms of the right. structures and the processes. So we're still having yeah. to work very yeah. much through the old institutional infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. And the different cultures in the organizations, <coughs> trying to form a new culture as a, as yeah. a division. Yeah. The colleagues we had to say goodbye to, we lost over you know, half of our colleagues, and that may still continue. Yeah. I mean, that's never an easy thing mm. Um, mm. to come mm. to terms to, to come to terms with. Um, and I think the impact that it has on our partners who are, are trying to really follow what that means in practical terms, yeah. in terms of our response times, uh, the choices that we're making, because when we make choices, we have to let go of other things. So the yeah. things that we're letting go of, um, you know, all those, uh, you know, cause a lot of flux that will take a while to yeah to settle down. To settle down, yeah. Yeah, great. And so I know, I mean, you know, restructuring, right sizing, among other things, is really not an easy process. I mean, a lot of change management needs to. Going to into that, so so it's it's bound to create some of these uncertainties and some mm. of these uncomfortable moments. Mm. But I suppose one of the things that maybe you are aiming to do as an institution is to be efficient, is mm -hmm. to be nimble, is to be able to move faster. And you know, you can only move faster if you if you are lean. Mm. Um, I always think of you know when I took over the Southern Africa Trust. One of our key donors came and said, you know, we are stopping funding in the next year. Mm. And when we started thinking about how do we respond, one of the consultants that we're working with said, you have to think of it this way. If you have, if you have, if you have a big aircraft mm. and you want to take off, you need a long runway. Mm -hmm. But if you want to take off on a short runway, mm. in this case the runway was the one year that we were given, mm. then you must be lighter. So, 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 so those are some of the things that I think when mm. we think about right sizing, restructuring, mm. and efficiency, mm. the advantages and disadvantages. But let's move to what you are doing now, mm. um, your role as the division head mm. for women's rights. Mm. Women's issues across the continent have remained problematic in terms of them not being given the attention that they ought to be by our governments, by international institutions, by policy makers. And in fact, in some countries, we even have so many exclusions, uh, so many oppressions, even laws, and gender-based violence is on the increase. Mm. Could you perhaps talk a bit about what your role mm. in the division, but mm. also your division mm. as part of the larger foundation is seeking to do, mm. and what are the things that you want to see in the next five to ten years? Yeah. I mean, it's a an evolving con conversation, okay? Um, I should have mentioned that one of the key aims that we want to do is to make larger grants over longer periods yeah. of time yeah. and more flexible um, funding that allows the, the, the partner organizations to respond yeah. uh, to an ever-shifting, you know, um, uh, context um, on the continent. So we want to move away from that programmatic yeah. uh, style of, of work, which we welcome very much. I think another thing for us um, in, in OSF, which we're really, really proud of, is the fact that we have recognized that, um, you know, that feminist movements, um, feminist philanthropies, have been at the forefront of transformational shifts, of really um, addressing the sort of structural issues of uh, inequality uh, through a lens of um, you know, power analysis and how power plays along the sort of socially constructed identities yeah. of class, 
of, uh, of gender, of race, um, ethnicity, religion, age, and so on, uh, and disability, and so on. And um, so what we have done is, you know, try to match the analysis with the resource envelope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was done um, in, the, in this new strategy was one, commit to feminist analysis, to growing feminist movements, um, but also uh, the budget and the way it was crafted was that 30% of the total budget, at least 30% yeah. of the total budget was earmarked for women's rights, something that had not happened in any of the foundations right. before that. Um, and what that meant was that there was a pool of money in which we have a standalone program and then we mainstream across our other pillars, but also um, partner very, very closely with um, the global programs in creating a larger pool to fund feminist movements, yeah. especially those, mo those movements that have a lived experience of um, you know these uh, multiple oppressions that happen all at the same time. I'm not just discriminated against because yeah. I'm a woman. Yeah. I'm discriminated against because I'm black. I may be discriminated because I'm young and disabled and so on. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is to create support for those um, those communities. Um, that in many ways are at the forefront of the pushback, but are not seen. Uh, what they know is not valued. What they experience isn't valued. Um, and their efforts aren't supported. Yeah. We want to do a great deal of that, both through uh, the feminist funds, but also through other mechanisms and, and so on. Now, the key objective or the key... I think um, a goal that um, OSF is uh, um, looking at is these growing uh, movements or these growing phenomena of authoritarian governments, the pushback yeah. on many of the democratic gains. And the closing, the closure and of the civic space. And the yeah. closure of the civic space and, mm. and all the attendant problems that come with that racial um, injustice, Islamophobia, you know, homophobia, anti-feminist movements. And we're seeing this phenomenon the world over. Yeah. And so the key, you know, the key the key objective is one around challenging those authoritarian regimes. Um, and so like we have said, what we have seen is that black feminists, uh, black um, communities of women who have been pushed to the margins have been at the forefront of the pushback, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in uh, the Middle East, Iran, we see what's happening in Iran, whether it's in Sudan, Nigeria, uh, um, Ethiopia, and other places like that. So, um, yeah, I think the key thing is, you know, how do we do that? But then also, how do we reimagine yeah. democracy? Yeah. Because the liberal democracy didn't work for the vast majority of people, especially yeah. uh, communities of color around the globe for all kinds of historical and present reasons. So how do we reimagine a uh, uh, democracy that has a, uh, you know, a governance, but also our economies yeah. um, and our social uh, contexts that are, you know, rooted in the principles of equality, redistributive justice, economic justice. Yeah. So and climate, climate. Um, yeah. Climate justice, yeah. So, sorry, I, I, I probably cut your, your no, thinking process. No. But as you were speaking, I was, rem I was thinking of the conversations that we have had over the past three days. Mm. And one of the things that came up, which is a statistics that shocked me, is that only 1% of global funding goes to black women's organizations. 
and out of that one percent we don't know how much goes to feminist mm. organizations mm. and i'm happy to hear that there's a 30 percent dedication mm. at least from your foundation mm. towards that work mm. what else needs to be done from a funding point of view i mean you have influence as yourself mm. um, when you look at other donors around mm. what what needs to be done to change that figure I mean, you know, the first question that we also need to ask ourselves in this business, and I remember on that plane, we had that, we had that conversation, is if we are interested in social justice uh, philanthropy, the questions we have to keep asking ourselves is to what extent do we... Um, do we reinforce the inequalities that we see out there internally? Yeah. Right? So inside, the, the, as somebody said at this conference and has been said before, the process of change begins from within. Right? You, you, you can't change what you, what you... You can't be the change if you yourself <laughs> yeah. aren't that change. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the process of reflection from within, right? What are our systems and our processes? How are we administering these? these um, how are we making decisions around the grants that we make? How, are the, how do we answer to the constituencies around the decisions that we make? And how do we speak up um, in these communities? And to what extent do we create space, right? Um, one of the things that we, we really wanted to do in Africa was we didn't want to localize African, uh, you know, organizing in Africa itself. We know that there are many, many African initiatives and organizations that have a global reach yeah. and global mandate. Mm -hmm. We are Africa as part of the global, right? So we are working in Africa to rebuild what is here, but we also need to change what's in the global, right? right? And we need to be able to uh, resource that financially, technically, and, and so on. So the real commitment for us, I think, in, in within the limitations of what we can do, right? The critical thing that we have done in terms of philanthropy is to say our commitment is to African organizations. It's to building African infrastructure. It's to building African knowledge for alternatives uh, rather than African knowledge for echo chambering yeah. the inequalities yeah. because there's a lot of that around, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so really resourcing African knowledge building, African research, um, led, really trying to be the, the place that makes this visible and recognizes it as legitimate and as having contributions to make um, uh, in the world, right? So we need those alternatives, and we need those alternatives from our lived experience of what it means uh, uh, to be impacted by the lack of, of, of not having them. And then I think, you know, the... There is work that has been done around legislative policy shifting and so on. Um, I guess the momentum around that should be kept up into how do we get these, uh, these agreements, these commitments off the paper that they're on yeah. into the practice. Because most of the time they're observed more in the breach than in the observance. Yeah. So how do we get them off the paper and into the, into the practice and daily life of, of, of all of us? How do we create that accountability? The importance of building, uh, I guess, the leadership capacities, um, creating space for people to speak on behalf of themselves, but also to challenge, I think, the, some of the global um, inequalities that we see in our economic systems that are leading to the crisis around ecology, around climate. It's critical to do that, right? 
um, and to build alternatives, like I said. And yeah. I think that's the contribution that we can make, um, it, uh, you know, to do this. We need to have, we need to have state systems and structures. And I know that there are many in the Pan-African movement who question the legitimacy yeah. of the states that we have now and see them as relics of colonial, you know, which are not capable of reform. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a debate. We need to listen to that debate. We need to shape alternatives. Yeah. But at the same time, it's important for us to build strong states that respond to the needs of, yeah. of who we are yeah. as constituents. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that. I mean, we can go on and on about open society, you know, about probably close to 20 years now. One of my chapters for my PhD is actually on the Open Society Foundation right. so in Africa. So I have lots of interest. Okay. But that's Sarah today. Mm -hmm. uh, can we go back mm -hmm. and uh, get to know Sarah? Um, so the, the, I, I see from the last last work that you've been doing, and mm -hmm. I know actually, uh, mm -hmm. I see and I also know, that you also were, you spent a lot of your time. Mm -hmm. In fact, if there's one organization that I think you have worked the most for, mm -hmm. is the African Women's Development Fund. Mm -hmm. And so before we talk about the work there, how was the transition from <laughs> the African Women's Development Fund, which was on the one hand, an organization that would mobilize resources, mm -hmm. but also do grant making. Mm -hmm. um, how was that transition from there to now the donor space? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, you know, it was a very interesting, a very, very interesting um, uh, transition. Yeah. Um, so I'd been working with the African Women's Development Fund for eight years. Um, I consider it my home. Yeah. I consider it, you know, it, it, that's where, it was where I grew up. It was where I, I learned, uh, you know, the, the, the politics around uh, philanthropy, resource mobilization. Um, often these things were presented to us as technical, you know, you need to build your technical capacities in order to be able to access more funds or in, able to, in order to be able to do more of this or more of that. It was, it was pre presented as a technical, yeah. technical <laughs> thing. Uh, you know, we always knew that there was always room to build your technical capacities. Yeah. Yeah. But the real work was the politics around it. Um, the way you had to jump through hoops to prove that as an African institution, <laughs> you could manage a two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollar grant, yeah. uh, you know that kind of thing. Um, but also in learning about building allies and building partnerships that were in the sort of global um, feminist movement and in other, um, you know, and in other parts of the world, you know, Ford Foundation and what it was doing um, to build uh, philanthropy in the South. Yeah. through the special initiatives and so on that was running. Um, and so I came, I left AWDF because I really wanted to understand why the flow of money uh, was not coming, was, was flowing but very disproportionately, yeah. in my view, to the work that organizations like AWDF, Urgent Action Fund, and others were doing on the ground because they were covering a lot of ground. Yeah. I didn't understand why this money wasn't coming or this recognition. So it's because it's not always about, about money. money yeah. It's yeah. about this validation of recognition. So I thought, you know, the most friendly organization is the Open Society Foundations. Yeah. I looked up, out uh, into Open Society and it was really exciting what they were doing. Yeah. Taking risks, being really political, you know, um, 
doing things in ways other philanthropies yeah. weren't doing them, yeah. right? Responding nimbly, quickly, and so on. Yeah, but also the, the very philosophy of opening yes. closed societies. It exactly. Does, it, it doesn't really matter exactly. whether it's economic, technological, but yes. they, once you hear uh, we exist to open closed societies. Absolutely. That on its own is an invitation to Absolutely. be part of the journey. Yeah. And, the, and yeah. the, the, the founder, George Soros, was very committed, yeah. Yeah. committed to that. I mean, um, very, very committed to yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, was very open to let's give this a try. Um, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. But we yeah. can't, we can't not take this opportunity to do this because it's too difficult or we don't know yeah. where we will land. Uh, you know, so so I, I, I wanted to be a part of that. But then I got in and I realized <laughs> it's a human rights organization. It's all of these things. It's not necessarily a feminist organization. Um, in the sense that um, didn't really know, didn't really understand, didn't really... Yeah. But I, I just found that their take on feminism and, you know, um, responding to women's movements, um, it, 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 it just wasn't flowing the way I'd expected it. I think there were things that I, I felt I needed to explain. And many of the feminists working in that institution, we always felt that there were things that we, yeah. we needed to explain, which was fine because, you know, you need to be able to articulate precisely why these contributions need to be made in these, you yeah. know, in these, into these movements. So yeah. for us, it was an opportunity to build that technical um, capacity because previously we'd been in spaces where we didn't need to explain to one another why it was important to do feminist education. Yeah. For example, yeah. political yeah. education. Or why it was important to pay, to, to, to address the care needs um, in, a, in a context where you didn't have state provision for care yeah. um, and so on, for, for human rights defenders. Um, understanding that, you know, uh, women's human rights defenders did not live their lives according to issue. Today it's election. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, freedom of expression and so on. Women were living with violence, with poverty, with ill health, HIV. We're living with all of these things at the same time. Yeah. They had a much more holistic approach. Um, and, and a much more, I think, radicalized approach to um, human rights itself, in yeah. which, yeah. you know, we don't live by compartmentalizing, you know. Yeah. But I find that, I found that experience uh, a bit of a shock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was also a period where I learned how the mainstream in human rights think and work. Yeah. It was a place and how there are things there that we can adapt and learn, but there are also things there that we can transform. Yeah. Then there are also allies that we can build in those spaces, um, and they come from the most unlikely places. Um, but also opposition comes from the most unexpected yeah. places yeah. to these things. Yeah. So for me, that's been a further uh, yeah. an, an exciting yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm assuming that despite all the difficulty and maybe even the first moments of discomfort and among that, something prepared you, uh, AWTF prepared you for, for something like this. Absolutely. So what were some of the key moments during your time with the women, African Women's Development Fund that still today you look back and say these were some of the key things that helped me to even move into this new position. Because when you look at the new configuration of OSF and the mm -hmm. people that they've been brought in, mm -hmm. these are people who have a long history of activism, 
Mm. Especially in the women's movement. You talk of Muthoni, you talk of yourself, mm -hmm. Caroline, and many others. Mm. I can go on and on. Something prepared you. What are those key moments from the time at the African Women's Development Fund? <sighs> Where do I start? I mean, <clears throat> you know, the community of sisterhood that you build in an institution like African Women's Development Fund, it isn't a place you leave, right? It's a home you can come back to. Um, and whenever I go to Ghana, whenever my colleagues in, a, in, in African Women's Development, it, it's a sisterhood, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't call it. It's a siblinghood. It's a siblinghood, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and therefore, you always have people you can call to say, look, this, I have a, an issue around it. Yeah. How do I build a response to it? It's important to have that support network. Because this cannot be done alone, yeah, right? Yeah. But I would also say that a critical part of the African Women's Development Fund was to build the leadership capacities, both technical and political. Mm -hmm. And to understand a little bit more about how you put a case together, how you challenge, uh, uh, I guess, patriarchy and power, right? Yeah. in how you defend your case, right, without apology <laughs> uh, to, to, you know, to the powers that be. Um, if they come on board, they come on board. If they don't, they don't. We, we, we are, you know, we had this philosophy that if your heart is there and your heart is true, the money will follow. Yeah. Yeah. The money will follow. And there may be a, a, a um, so I guess the, 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 the point was to always self-examine what's the motivation for this. Yeah, hmm? yeah. Is this the heart? Do I really feel that this is in the best interests of the constituencies I serve? Yeah. That was always the first thing that goes in your mind. How does this make the constituency look? Yeah. Mm? Yeah. Which fight must I fight? Yeah. For the constituency. Mm? Yeah. Um, how do I frame that fight? What are the technical capacities that I need to be able to do this? And you know, this absolute <sighs> field of fear, but do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So yesterday there was a moment, even today, yeah. where there were about probably four generations. Mm. Um, of uh, AWDF staff members, mm -hmm. um, from CEOs to program directors. Mm. So, you know, Jessica Horn took over from you mm. as the program's director, mm. and Francois took over from Theo, and, mm. and all four of you were here. Mm. And that moment seemed to really raise other issues for you, mm. uh, and as we were closing the conference, you said, wait a minute, Actually, it's not just AWDF, but it's other institutions as well. Maybe can we spend a few minutes just talking about that moment for you, mm. now looking back at what you have produced, because you have a big alumni as AWDF, yeah. but, but so have other institutions. Absolutely. But, but, yeah. but let's just focus it on AWDF. Right. Well, I mean, let me answer two things. Yeah. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, Becky, that you know, the business of activism, we all came to this as mm -hmm. activists. Yeah. Um, at least speaking for myself. I came to it, as an act, to it as an activist. I was tired of seeing the violence against women. I was tired of seeing the inequality. I was tired of seeing the feminization of poverty. I was tired of seeing Africa completely waste its opportunities huh? by being so stuck in a situation in which we were both, uh, we were tackling issues of, you know, the, the sort of racial injustice and the colonial um, legacies, hmm? as well as our own, you know, uh, our, our own beliefs and traditions around uh, um, the, the place of different people in society, men, women, uh, you know, and all of this. I'm so tired 
of seeing that. And that's why I came into this work as an activist to say, let me try and do my small, small thing yeah. To, yeah. to at least see where we, I come from a long line of, of activists. My yeah. grandmother fought to get people in school, women in school, and so on. So I said, let me come and do my small, small piece. Yeah. But then you realize that actually, you're also in the business of building institutions, right? Yeah. And that the, the, the problem of institutions have a very low trust value in Africa, whether there are state institutions, whether there are, you know, what, what, what have you. We have an, a unique experience in Africa in which our relationship with institutions that work on our behalf is one in which there is a low value trust. Yeah. Unless those institutions are community driven, owned, and so on. So the yeah. local yeah. philanthropic giving, we call it informalized, but they're institutionalized practices because they've been going on for a number of yeah. years. Yeah. But what characterize those forms of, of giving and organizing were that the community owned and um, ran them and, and decided what the agenda was. The difference here is that these institutions were built, the institutions that we were trying to build were built outside of people's daily lived, you know, uh, uh, contact yeah. with these institutions. Yeah. And they had a particular trust value. So there was a narrative that was built about, you know, Africans don't know how to build institutions. Uh, Africans can't manage this issue of uh, transitions because their institutions are so weak. You remember all those programs that came around capacity building, technical capacity building, blah, blah, blah. We do all this and do all that. Um, so there was a particular narrative that was being told that our institutions are weak that we within them don't run them very well. And one of the key challenges, Achilles heel, is in the transition. When one, uh, especially the leaders within those institutions move on, uh, usually the institution yeah. collapses. Yeah. That was the, the main story that was being told. And it had an impact because People just didn't want to fund institutions, didn't yeah. want to fund yeah. the growth of institutions. And you remember, and I think it still goes on today, where many d donors or many funders in the traditional pool of funders for um, social justice work will only want to fund your project. They don't want to uh, pay a cent to you know, the machinery that will make that project work. Yeah. So for me, the, sitting in this room and my own experience having left AWDF and like I'm saying, never having had a problem, never having to think about how is that organization being run yeah. after I've left. Yeah. It was, I was confident that it would only build better right. on what was right. done. So when I sat in this room and when Jessica said, Jessica Horn said, you know, there are four, three generations of leaders here, I thought, my God. Yeah. And then I looked around the room and I said, it's not just AWDF. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the in generations of leadership yeah. Yeah. in all these institutions, institutions yeah. that only 15, 20 years ago were trying to justify we're yeah. fighting to yeah. justify yeah. their existence and so i said no we must tell this story yeah. of what collectively these institutions yeah. have done in terms of a tradition and in terms of longevity and in terms of sustainability yeah, yeah. yeah. so we have to lend mm. uh, but before we do that um one of the things that i really really wanted to to talk about, but maybe we'll do it at, in, in another follow-up conversation. Because mm. I see that for me, everything goes back to your upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having grown up in the in the UK, mm. 
worked there, but also having started working for Akina Mama wa Africa yeah. there, and then back in Uganda. For me, that's probably where the foundation for all this activism that we're talking about seems to be stemming from. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when we do talk again, I would want us to go back there. Okay. But, but let's end, let's end with where it started. Mm -hmm. So who, in short, is Sarah? Let's go back to the young Sarah. Where it all started? Where all this AWDF started no, no, no. or where Sarah's activism Sarah, started? Yeah. Where Sarah's Not activism. even activism. We're talking about the young Sarah. Okay. Uh, Sarah uh, is from Uganda. Yeah. Her parents was born in England. Uh, in, you know, parents met as students in the UK and had Sarah there. Uh, but came back to Africa. I have, it on my maternal side, I have my my great grandfather gave, and his uh, and my great grandmother had about fourteen children, only two of whom were boys. So my great grandfather decided, if this is what I've been given, then this is my wealth, and I'm going to invest in making these uh, these girls the best that they can be. So he insisted that they have education. Um, but more than anything, he insisted that they had their own ideas and thoughts in their heads. I'll give you a little anecdote. One of my grandmothers uh, was, was ex expelled from a school. This was back in the 1930s. Um, and they called my gra great-grandfather, her father, to explain that she had been expelled because she had let led a revolt mm -hmm. around the food mm -hmm. that they were being that they were being given. So his question to the headmistress was, um, I want to know, was she the leader or was she the led? Mm -hmm. Was she part of the leadership or did she lead this or did she follow? So the headmistress said, No, she was the leader. She was the leader <laughs> of the party. <laughs> so my great grandfather said in that case, I have absolutely no problem. Yeah, <laughs> expel her. <you>. Expel her. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I'm proud, yeah. you know, that she is a leader. To be led and you don't understand what you're being led right, for right. is foolish. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, what, is the point that he was trying to make. Wow. So he inculcated a, a culture amongst his, his children. And they passed it on to their children. And, um, you know, I, I, at the same time, I watched a situation in which many women in, in, in my family who were more than capable, who were clever, who were wise and so on, being denied opportunities yeah. just yeah. because yeah. they were born uh, women. I saw many people who were, you know, had a... a uh, a sexual orientation that uh, because these are things have been in our yeah. families for so yeah. long my family who uh, you know were were gay or same sex and had to completely disguise who they were right and in many cases loathe themselves for who they were and all their brightness all their contributions all their you know being completely squandered just because they had this sexual yeah. uh, orientation, which yeah. was different. And I just felt this can't, I can't live like this. I can't be, I, you know, I, I, you know, at that time, there was an HIV crisis. There was war in my country. And so we had to go back to London. And, you know, the, the, the racism that was being meted out against, you know, refugee communities yeah. and so on. Yeah. I used to rage about these at college with my friend Ioma Obibi, who was then working at Akina Mama or Africa, yeah. and said, you can't keep complaining. There's this small community group. Let's yeah. go and yeah. do something about yeah. it. That yeah. was my awakening. And, uh, Sarah, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I'm sure we'll continue the conversation. 
uh, you can't keep complaining. I think, <laughs> I, think, I think we end on a very, very good note. That was Sarah Mukasa, currently the Division Director for Women's Rights Africa at the Open Society Foundations Africa. Um, thank you for watching the episode. See you next time. You've been listening to the Capsi podcast series, Conversations on African Philanthropy.